Institute, where he founded where he founded and directed and directs the collection of tissues and the Inner Institutional Laboratory for the Detection of Genetically Modified Organisms. Also, he teaches courses in molecular biology techniques, biodiversity, and evolution at the Universidad de Colombia at Palmira and the University of Cordoba. Cordoba. Um, so without further ado. Um, Cor Cordoba in Argentina? Oh, uh, unmute yourself, Juan. Cordoba in Argentina, you mean? No, in Colombia. Oh. oh. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so take it away, Juan. Okay. Thank you, Gabe, for this invitation. And thank you, all of you guys, to be here uh, this evening. For me, it's a pleasure to talk to you about, I don't know, uh, economic botany, maybe, on Colombia, from the tropics, from the Andes. Uh, currently, I am working in a agricultural research institution from the Colombian government. So it's like a USDA ARS, Agricultural Research Service, something like that. So I am the director of the main field station, agricultural field research station in Colombia, maybe close to Bogota. As you know, Bogota is in the top of the Andes, uh, around 5,600 meters. Uh, I don't know how it's in in feet, but it's, it's very high, it's very top in the mountains. So it's very cold right now when the sun is is uh, down, it's becoming very cold. So uh, I want to talk to you about in how we are taking advantage of our biodiversity uh, to look for development. I mean, for to look for uh, new crops for exportations. So I we are working, you know, we have a lot of breeders, plant breeders here in, in, in my institution. So I want to show you how we try to take advantage of the diversity. But first, I want to make a context about Colombia. It's not Colombia, <laughs> like, the district is Colombia with O, no with U, this very common uh, mistake or misspelling uh, from my country. So let me start. So the outline is very, is very straightforward, very short. It's uh, something about Colombian biodiversity contest, agricultural research constant, contest in Colombia and local improved crops. So, as you know, Colombia is in the tropics. Uh, half of the part is the in North Hemisphere. Uh, south part is the South Hemisphere, especially the Amazon. Um, we are of these biodiversity hotspots in the planet. We have one hotspot, biodiversity hotspot here in the Andes, and another one in the Pacific coast, we call that Choco biogeographic, and also in the Caribbean coast. We have coasts in both oceans, as you guys, uh, in the Caribbean and in the Pacific. So that strategic position in the northwest of South America uh, becomes like a bridge between North, Central, and South America uh, biodiversity. So it's a very strategic position in terms of uh, biodiversity. So we have some records. We have uh, in terms of taxonomy classification species, we are the second country in the world with more number of species in terms of area. 
And we have some records, as I tell you, uh, in birds, we are the first country. There are around 10,000 uh, birds, described birds. Um, we have the 20% and some of them are endemics. So we have also first place in, in butterflies, uh, Lepidoptera, insects. And some another record, second country with more species of amphibians, the reptiles and mammals, the four place. So this is a, a test or uh, taste of the biodiversity in Colombia. Also in plants, this is our topic today. I talked to, about plants. Is in orchids, we have the first place in the world in in orchids number and um, you know orchids used to hybridize between them so the it may be possible the number increase soon uh, every year they the botanists discover new species of orchids so it's a grow number and this biodiversity has some causes well, i mean we are in the tropics uh, and we have a lot of different regions. So here in yellow, you can see the Caribbean region. We have the Caribbean divided into, into areas. The wet Caribbean region is here to the left and to the right is the dry. Actually, this here close to Venezuela, this is Venezuela here, is very desert uh, environment. So also we have this uh, border with Panama, Central America, and we have this line here is the Chocobio Geographico, is the Pacific Coast, is one of the more rainy places in the world. Uh, so the biodiversity here is very special. And this central part here, the big central part is the Andes Cordillera. And the Andes in Colombia, is divided in three branches that makes a uh, more place for the explosion of biodiversity. We have the, the, the west branch, the central branch, and the east branch. Bogota is here. I am talking to you from a, a place around here. It's in the uh, east branch of the Cordillera, and this Cordillera goes to Venezuela also. The other two branches died here in Colombia. So between these branches, there are some valleys. And these valleys make uh, uh, isolation between the branches. And that makes also more places for the speciation of the uh, biodiversity. So we have here the Orinoco. Savannah is a huge savanna shared with Venezuela also. All the Venezuela oil come from this area. We have some oil also in this area is the Orinoco Basin. And this big area here to the south is, is the Amazon, our Colombian Amazon region. So or Amazon Basin, the Amazon River comes from here, Ecuador, Peru, and cross here uh, to Brazil. But this is our tropical Amazon jungle. It's a huge part of Colombia, at least almost the half part. And that is almost inhabitants. We don't have uh, too much people there living. So most of the people in Colombia lives here in the Andean part and the Caribbean coast. This also, these parts are more empty, to say something. So that is one of the reasons we have a lot of biodiversity because we have a lot of mm, ecosystems, different ecosystems. So we are talking today about this part of the biodiversity which is useful or the plant biodiversity which is useful. We call that agrobiodiversity. And there are several crops here, also livestock, also microorganisms. We work with microorganisms, also with livestock. 
but I want to talk more focus here in crop species and some varieties. So we are rich in biodiversity, but also in crops. You can see these hot spots of uh, crops and in the Andes, we share the hot spot for beans, a potato, quinoa, and tomato. In the south, in the this dry coast of Peru, there are a lot of Solanaceae species, uh, the tomato in particular. So this uh, hot spot of agrobiodiversity is important for our diet and cultural preference. And actually, if you take these plants, edible plants or plants to be used in medicine or art craft, home, homemade crafts. So, and you, I mean, you take the huge biodiversity and also a rich indigenous people cultures. So the indigenous people culture start to use the resources available, the plants available, and by domestication, this relationship between plants and humans, these beautiful relationships between plants and humans, a lot of different kinds of cultures and the huge diversity that makes a lot of uh, domestication ways. So we can use one wild progenitor, but for different preference, the indigenous people start to select this wild progenitor and start to make a lot of different kinds of uh, subjects. And we have this, this is a, a, a nice picture of different tomatoes, uh, maybe the same species, but by different selections process, that is domestication, no? different selection process, we can make this uh, huge diversity from the same species. So one character is under selection, the fruit size, color, flavors, different uh, traits that people select by different uh, purposes. So we make this huge uh, diversity available. Diversity, which is almost losing. If you go to a supermarket, we can just find a few of them, but in the wild or in the farmers uh, places, you can find a lot of diversity. However, uh, Colombia is a big exporter. This is a, uh, uh, you know, our exportation goods. So we are right now more, uh, this uh, green is more uh, cold. So our big, we are a big producers of uh, plants, but they are not from Colombia. For example, coffee is from Africa, but we are a coffee exporter, actually a famous coffee exporter. Also bananas, they are from Asia. Uh, flowers, they are from Europe. Palm oil, well, some of them are from Colombia. And let's see what else. Yes, coffee, bananas, flour, palm oil. Also, we are a huge producer of sugar cane, but that is also from Asia. So we are rich in biodiversity, but we exported another goods you know, from Colombia. So the issue right now, or the question we make every time is, why if we have a lot of biodiversity, that biodiversity doesn't become a options from, from the economic option from the country, no? for the uh, money to export, and to foreign aid countries. So we are working on that, improving these agrobiodiversity crops or plants 
to improve the options in the uh, outside countries, overseas countries to export. So right now we are working in this uh, uh, agricultural research, the Colombian Corporation of Agricultural Research, which is the uh, USDA ARS service uh, in Colombia. And we are trying to rescue this uh, huge agrobiodiversity to first to produce enough for food security in Colombia, no? to depend less for importations. We import a lot of corn, soybean from Argentina, Brazil, US, uh, Canada. So we are developing these traditional crops to substitute these importations, working on it. Uh, I want to show you some of the examples. So this Colombian Corporation of Agricultural Research has places around the country. And I am here, the 19, but we are, we had a research center, a regional office around the country, mainly in the agricultural places. As I told you, the Amazon is not very well developed. The um, Orinokia is also not very well developed. And that is great. That is nice for the biodiversity. And also the Choco region is uh, very, uh, it's very hard to go there, like basically. And so it's, kind of protected. So the main agricultural in Colombia is here in the Andes. So our main of our research centers are there. So as I told you, we, we, we work in, in uh, agricultural research, animals and plants, also microorganisms. Uh, this is our budget, annual budget is not bad. No good, but uh, we work with that seventy million dollars each year, and um, uh, we had funding for the government, Colombian government, but also for private corporations and other members, especially uh, agencies uh, for development uh, from the Europe, North America, U U.S. aid. Uh, help a lot to this research in order to substitute the cocaine crops or coca crops. So we are working a lot with the US government in that way. So also we had the Hermoplans Banks of Colombian Nation for Food and Agriculture. We keep this huge biodiversity I showed you before. We keep the seeds. We have uh, in vitro collections and we have also uh, uh, botanical gardens, uh, crops, field crops collections. Uh, so these odds are our number for microorganisms and plants. We have uh, more than 30, 33, 36,000 accession of agricultural importance seeds in between field. So you can see the numbers here and also for animals. Uh, the cattle, you know, the cattle came from Europe with um, the European people. So, but they have been adapted very well to some environments in the tropics. So we can share, keep these old races to, to keep them for, for the future uses in breeding. So this is the our germoplants collection, maybe the, one of the main important of the field station I am working on. So in terms of research and development, uh, we have been working in this agrobiodiversity and we are divided our research in different uh, networks. We have the cocoa network, cattle and uh, small species, permanent crops, root and tuber crops, vegetables, annual and industrial crops, and fruit crops. So these 
seven innovations network is how we divided our research. But I want to focus uh, my presentation right now is just in the plants. Um, in the breeding process, we are developed for, for develop new varieties of these uh, Asian crops we are using in Colombia. So this is a big picture of the main varieties we have developed. Cocoa, obviously, golden berry, sorghum, onions, uh, marañón. I, I don't know how to say marañón in English. Maybe uh, I, I can show you pictures. Sweet potato, cassava. Cassava is, uh, uh, we have a lot of work in cassava. Cassava is from the Amazon. So it's an important starch source. Uh, also potato, different uh, kind of potatoes. Oh, sorry. Um, oat, uh, corn, cotton, guava, eggplant, oil palm, beans, resinous, rice, sugarcane, and guinea grass. Sugarcane is not um, native from Colombia, but it's very important. I, I will tell you why. Not just for sugar. We use the sugarcane for another purposes, and I will show you as follow. So let's talk about tuber crops. So we have this uh, tuber crop, it's called arracacha, it's arracaxa in English maybe, I don't know, I, I, I had never seen that when I was living in Texas in the market, in the uh, Hispanic market, I had never seen that, it's very from uh, the Andes in Colombia, it has a very important uh, starch or carb sources and you can see the huge uh, plantation here is uh, a huge crop field uh, it's very important we develop this variety called Ar Arracacha la 22 Arracaxia 22 so it's uh, very important the, this yellowish color is because it has an important levels of uh, carotene. Carotene is a precursor of vitamin A. So it's very important also sources of vitamins. This is one of the local crops. We use these crops in, in different ways. We fry them as a chips. Also, we make that in a soup. Uh, it's very sticky uh, soup and it is very important in our diet. The other one is the sweet potato, the, the genus Ipomea, the species Ipomea batata. And as you know, we have a very rich uh, area of Ipomea species in the world here in the Andes. So we take advantage of that um, diversity. As, as you know, the batata is a um, uh, this grove is uh, over the soil. So in the Caribbean islands or the Caribbean coast in Colombia, after one, uh, each hurricane came and go out, the only over the surface is this uh, sweet potato, the Ipomea, because the trees goes down or the other crop fields goes down, plantain, bananas, uh, sugarcane, or uh, and other crops are devastated by the hurricanes. So the only crop available uh, is this uh, sweet potato. So that is a very important after, after tropical storms. So we develop several varieties of this uh, crop. We have this, this batata ambarina is the name we did. Uh, it has a high yield, is very important, high protein. Crops are not famous for protein, but this, in particular, this variety has um, decent content of protein. Vitamin A, you can see the color. The color can show you the kind of uh, vitamin A and is used 
to feed porks. So we can make these uh, crops in a animal protein. So it's very important also for the equation. We have this another uh, variety. We developed this variety, um, batata aurora. Sweet potato in Spanish is batata, at least here in Colombia. I don't know, maybe in the Central America or the until Antilles Islands and the Caribbean Islands, they can, can use another names, but we call it here batata. And you can see the, the growth is close to the surface of the soil. And this is our variety, but this is a uh, main use in for industrial purpose, for starch purposes, and also has a very high yield. The other tuber crops we use a lot in Colombia is potato. I mean, the potato is originally from the Titicaca Lake around between the Bolivia and Peru, but we have also a huge diversity of potato uh, uh, in Colombia, actually, I have uh, the next slide is uh, Solanum tuberosum potato uh, hot spot. It's here in the Andes uh, from the north of Argentina, Chile to the south of Colombia. So we use a lot of this uh, potato in different preparations. I mean, soaps, chips, uh, fries. And one of the most important is the yellow potato. It's very important in our diet. It's very, very important. I have never seen that in US when I lived there, but here is very important. So we developed this. We call that papa. It's a potato, papa. And criolla is means yellow. Uh, alaja is the name of this. Uh, alaja is like jewelry, uh, kind of that. So we developed this variety, is high yield, short harvest time, is very uh, it's short time to harvest, tolerance to diseases um, for industrial use, for starch mainly. You can see some varieties. We used to work with um, indig uh, farmers to develop these varieties because they had a very good eye <laughs> to to see the important traits we want to choose. So we work together. That is a research participative process in developing new varieties. So we develop this. And this yellow potato came from the section pureja of the Solan tuberosum species. Uh, we developed some other uh, yellow potato. This is called Start or Estrella. Uh, also uh, for this section pureja, um, it has a great edible qualities, less time of cooking, so that is important in order to use less energy and spend less time, and also it's short time to harvest. Um, the harvest time is very important because uh, if you reduce the time, you reduce the use of uh, chemistry uh, supplies and less time to the diseases and the insects to make uh, damage. So the harvest time is very important in order to use less um, yeah, uh, chemicals. This is another, another one, the, another yellow potato variety we developed. It's called Solandina. It's like son of the Andes. Uh, yeah, and it's very important site for our barbecue. We call this uh, meaty uh, meat, uh, meaty meal called, um, oh, it, we call the, uh, oh, I forgot, uh, fritanga. <laughs> it's the several pieces of meat, pork, chicken, um, cattle meat is, and the yellow potato is very important site. Is the, is the site mainly from this uh, barbecue Colombian style food. It has also industrial uses. Um, it's used as a, as 
site and high search content. So for that reason is used uh, in terms of make search to reduce the use of corn for a search. And for the other section, indigena, the regular potato we saw in our chips or fries in, in North America. This is the Idaho potato um, crop. We developed also this uh, papamari. is a huge potato, uh, especially used for chips and fries, industrial uses also. Yeah, and its tolerance to diseases because we are origin center of origin also we have a lot of diseases and pests so we need to work a lot in develop new varieties every five years we need to release a new variety because the diseases and the pests they they evolve constantly to block the resistance and we need to develop each uh, five, four years, new varieties to, to, to uh, guarantee the survival of the potato. So this is one of the, our recent uh, varieties. This is another variety. Oh, I, had, I have a mistake here. It's not Mari, it's called Perla Negra, which is, uh, black pearl, uh, the name came from the color of the skin. It's like a purple, black, and it's very starchy, very, very starchy. And this is the way we make it. This is like a fancy way to make, to cook it. So it's very high in zinc and iron. It's a very important minerals, high vitamin C, is used in cheap and fries, and it's also tolerance to diseases. This new variety. This variety is from two or three years ago. It's a very new. Not too many people have adopted this crop, but we want to. They adopt the crop. The color. I mean, as a consumers, uh, we are very selective. So sometimes this is, looks like suspicious. So the market is not trying very well this uh, variety, but we want to gain more space in the market for this uh, crop because it has a lot of benefits. The other crops, the other tuber crops, we use a lot is cassava. Cassava is very important in the diet, uh, the Colombian diet. And the cassava is originally from the Amazon basin. So we have a lot of diversity. Actually, we have around six, thousand accessions in our germophones bank. So we have a lot of diversity to develop new varieties by breeding or just by selection. Sometimes we don't need to breed. We don't need to do crosses between uh, individuals because it's a huge diversity. And when we have some problems, maybe we have the solution in the collection. It's just, it just go to the collection, take, the, the accession we call that and just release that, make a name, make some field experiments, and that's that's all. That is the the good thing about the biodiversity. We can find the solutions just there. So in cassava, we developed this variety called yuca veloti. Cassava uh, we call in Spanish yuca. Uh, uh, cassava is a name used in Brazil, oh, Manihot, Manihot is the species. So we developed this, we developed varieties of cassava for two main purposes. So fresh use or industrial use. So this cassava has a lot of starch. Uh, cassava, the lifespan from storage is very short. So we are looking for varieties which we can storage for more time uh, under uh, normal conditions without use of uh, freeze cold conditions. And um, this in particular is also tolerant to insects and diseases. Also, we are 
center of origin of this crop. So we have also a lot of diseases and pests. So we developed this a few years ago. Uh, this is uh, another variety, ropain. This is like a cassava crops feel looks like. This is a um, uh, we we plant the new crops using uh, pieces of the uh, plant. We don't use seeds, uh, sexual seeds. We use just pieces of the the stem of the plant. So it's a clonal propagation. You can say that is the this this variety qualities, starch production, storage pro properties, and tolerance insects and disease. The other major crops we work in breeding is cocoa, because we are center of origin of cocoa. You can see also the Amazon basin. Cocoa came from after a while. It moved for Central America, and cocoa is very important for uh, indigenous people in Central America, Maya, Azteca, and, and other cultures. But the huge diversity is here in the Amazon basin and in the uh, Pacific coast. So we work a lot in, in cocoa and we are becoming a very important exporter of cocoa. And cocoa is a key crop to substitution from coca. So the same area when we have uh, coca, uh, we can plant or we can make this cocoa as an option or uh, replace this bad crop for this good crop. So we are working a lot for cocoa for peace. For example, the government of the US funding a lot of this research and develop new varieties of cocoa. The main issue we have with cocoa right now in Colombia is the high content of cadmium. It's a heavy metal. And um, the plant concentrate, accumulate this uh, metal in the seed, and we make chocolate from the seeds. So we are working a lot to reduce the cadmium concentrations in, in the seed for this crop. We are working a lot. We develop um, this uh, variety, which has uh, early harvest high yield and low content of cadmium. And we call this TCS01 cocoa, and the species is Teobroma cacao. We have a lot of species of Teobroma, so we can make crosses uh, easily. The other one uh, is this uh, TCS06. It's a more recently variety also. Uh, disease tolerance and with good yield, but it has a lot of high content of cadmium, so we need to work on it uh, still. Actually, we are working with people in Cornell, in Ithaca, uh, working with uh, transporters, cadmium transporters, that plant their, the roots, take the cadmium from the soil, and some transporters develop the, or deliver the cadmium to the seeds, and we are with uh, genetic addition blocking the transporters to avoid the accumulation of the cadmium in the seed. We are working right now the, with these colleagues there in Cornell to avoid the accumulations of the cadmium in the seed, especially for this variety, because this variety has a good tolerance diseases and high yield. So we need to make that low in cadmium. So we are working a lot in this variety. I hope to have these new varieties uh, as soon as possible. But mainly, I think the most exotic, um, I don't know how to say, uh, options to export is the fruits, the tropical fruits. So we are working a lot on, on these. Uh, one example is in the Solanum genus, we have a lot of uh, fruit species. We have this uh, called Lulu. 
is like uh, it's also called a tomatillo. Uh, maybe in US they call it tomatillo. We use that for making juices. You can see it's like a toma tomato, but um, has another flavors. It's very flavored. You can see how the plant looks, the fruits in the plant, and the crop field. And this new variety is called Lulo. We call Lulo the this uh, naranjilla, tomatillo, Lulo la selva, Solanum quitoense, it from the Andes. Oh, uh, actually, the name came from Quito, the capital of Ecuador. So the, the species, the type species agent, uh, specimen was collected near to Quito. For that reason, it's called Solanum quitoense. And um, it's very, it's a very popular fruit in Colombia to make this refreshing juice. You can find this pulp in supermarkets in East Coast. I, I used to buy that in Texas, in the Hispanic markets. It's uh, a little bit expensive, but you can find pulp from this. Um, uh, uh, fruit species. Uh, it's also, these are the traits, the high yield, tolerance to plagues, early harvest. And uh, the other special fruit for us is the guayaba. We call guava maybe in English, the seed in guajaba. You can see, oh, sorry. You can see the, I don't know what this is. You can see the diversity, the center of diversity of the guava. We have here in the Andes uh, a lot of varieties, natural varieties, or a lot of natural diversity of guava. And for us, it's very important because we we use the guava for use, to make juices, and actually we sell them. And you can see the fruit here, and this is the crop field, how the crop field looks. We developed this variety called guayaba carmine, and this is for industrial use. Also, we make a dessert from guava, from guayaba, it's called bocadillo, and it's very important. You can find also that in the supermarkets in the US. Uh, I found that in, in South of US, in Florida, Alabama, Texas, and also in East Coast, uh, close to, to DC in Virginia. I bought a long time ago guava. Um, it's like a, it's the presentation, it's like a bar. You, uh, it's a red bar, it's very flavored, very sweet, actually. We developed that, this another uh, variety called guayaba rose. Is high. It, this variety has a high content of vitamin C. Uh, this was developed for that purposes. Um, the use is industrial and also at home uh, in to make the guava dessert or also the guava juice. This is one of the, is becoming one of the most important uh, the exotic products we are exporting. Uh, it's called Uchua or golden berry in, in English. It's a Fisalis Peruviana, also Peru, from Peru, was uh, described there, but it grows very well here in, in the Colombian Andes and we have a lot of diversity. You can see the fruit, this is the plant, this is the field crop, and you can buy this uh, in uh, supermarkets in US uh, by this presentation. Actually, I took this picture in Virginia, in Manassas, very close to, to DC in the supermarket there. So it's exported from Florida company, but it's produced from Colombia. And it's becoming a very important, but we have a very strong um, disease called Fusarium, 
the starting of sporum is a fungi disease which has limited a lot of the crop fields. It's a disease from the soil. And when you have a fungi in the soil, it's very hard to remove. So this is a kind of nomad crop. When you plant crops, you take the harvest and you need to look for another place because the previous one is contaminated with the disease. Very hard, it's like a moving crop. So we are working a lot to look for resistance to disease. And we develop two varieties. One is called Andina, and the other one is called Dorada. The other uh, important crop we developed varieties is from sugarcane. Sugarcane is from uh, Asia. It came here from with the Spanish people uh, five centuries ago. And here is very common to make this solid presentation of uh, sugar cane. It's called panela in Colombia, but it's called piloncillo in Mexico. And uh, we, we take the juice of the sugar cane and we start to evaporate the juice until it becomes a very sticky liquid. And um, with that sticky, oh, this hot sticky liquid uh, becomes cold. It becomes like a rock. It's very solid. You can find that in the Goya products in the supermarkets uh, for very cheap price, <laughs> 95 cents in this moment in, in the south of the United States. That picture was taken in Mexico. Sorry, no, in Texas, in Austin, actually, um, Fiesta supermarket. And it's very cheap and it's very, uh, it's another kind of uh, sugar or sweetener uh, uh, you can find in the markets. And it's very important in Colombia for a uh, carb source in people, in very poor people. It's like a a uh, very basic product in the Colombian diet from the poor people in Colombia. So we are working in this species also. We develop uh, some varieties to, to make this special uh, product. It is different to the sugar uh, varieties. We need to develop varieties especially to produce panela. And um, I guess this is the, the broad test of how we are using our agrobiodiversity to make new varieties for food security, for our diet. Um, I hope you enjoy this fast uh, travel around our biodiversity uh, and research experiments. So, uh, thank you, you all guys, and um, I will be happy to answer some of your questions. Hello, Juan. I have a question. Can you hear me? Sure. Um, so, what a wonderful presentation! I'm I I've learned so much, and it's just been uh, uh, really fantastic to see how the the biodiversity is being, uh, you know, uh, developed, uh, and just learning about the food too. <laughs> it's just wonderful. Um, I wondered about, you know, as, as cut flowers are such a large export, is there a kind of um, competition for land space and, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, kind of uh, government support for, for cut flowers and, and, of course, the very important agricultural industry? It's very important. Uh, 
this cut flower is a very mature business here. Uh, almost all the production we sell uh, overseas. So we make a lot of dollars from this industry. That industry pay good salaries, uh, but doesn't have subsidies from the government because the industry is very mature right now. So they have actually, they have its own uh, research centers paid by them, paid by them, not for the government. And in terms of the land use, they use land very close to the airports. <laughs> no, <laughs> that makes order, sense. <laughs> it has sense, yes. In order to, to sell that easy. So you, okay, you came to Bogota actually by plane. You can see a, a lot of the greenhouses around the airport. And it's almost a plastified land. It's all, it's all the greenhouses, rain shelters. Uh, yeah. here in the Andes, in the top of the mountains, where the land is very expensive. So just this kind of crop, the crop you sell outside, is only the way to use these lands, because it's very expensive, very close to the city. Um, they generate a lot of uh, good job and, and employees. Uh, so yes, it's a very industrial crop, uh, flowers. Thank you. That's really fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. Juan, um, <clears throat> thank you. Excellent presentation. Um, really informative. Great stuff. Um, I wanted to, uh, I imagine it's, it is so, but um, it, in working with all these initiatives, um, is the overarching principle or goal to protect Colombia's incredible diversity, biodiversity? By not, by being very, very uh, stringent and careful about what it imports from Asia, uh, South Asia, Africa, Europe, U.S., wherever, anything that's not native, um, we have huge issues. That non-native invasive species, as you know, are mm -hmm. probably the number one threat to native biodiversity anywhere in the world, uh, just shy of of habitat loss through development and urbanization. Um, so we would hate to see economic gain or agricultural interest placed above safeguarding the area placeable. And I hope that, that um, Colombia is extremely uh, stringent on what it does, what it allows into its country. I suspect you probably have more trouble in the Southern Hemisphere with plants from Australia and Africa than you might from Northern Hemisphere. Um, but these days we see a mix and match of both hemispheres, um, um, still largely though, North and South. Thank you. Yeah, so we have a lot of problems also with uh, invasive species. Mm, the people in the past introduced a lot of crops or biological controllers um, that are becoming a risk factor to lose our biodiversity. Uh, we have examples in plants, frogs, insects, uh, which are invited our natural uh, ecosystems. Uh, we have a lot of problems. Um, our control is very poor. So for our borders, gold and in a lot of species all the time. So it's very hard to take control of the foreigners uh, species. So we have a lot of problems with invasive species here in Colombia. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is Ed here. <clears throat> I'm wondering, maybe you mentioned organic fruits and vegetables. I might have missed it because I had to leave the room for a little while. But I'm wondering, can Colombia grow many of those right now? You're in the tropics, so I imagine there's a huge number of pathogens and 
other things that would affect your crops. But are you able to grow any organic crops there now? Yes, we are. We are. Actually, because our farmers are very poor, they don't, they can't afford to buy uh, chemical uh, supplies. So mostly, I would say, by default, the 50% of the crops in Colombia are organic because they can't afford to buy uh, some supplies. So that is good uh, in terms of safety uh, for the consumer. Uh, so that's it's okay. Um, but as you say, our main problem is the diseases and the pests because they are co evolved with the crops for uh, centuries. So for that reason, we need to develop new varieties each time. And this is one of the main issues when we want to export because they are full of <laughs> diseases or pests and you know because we are now a free trade between countries but the sanitary conditions are becoming an issue the only issue is the sanitary conditions because the the the, the taxes or the other uh, trade issues are coming down so the free trade are developing this uh, movement around the world, but the sanitary conditions are the restriction right now. And we are working very hard to avoid these uh, restrictions to export our fruits and vegetables. Hi, this is Gene Rosenberg. In, your, in, your, in the AgroSavia's development of new cultivars, are you, just, are you using just traditional plant breeding techniques or are you also making use of molecular uh, approaches? Yes, uh, <laughs> when you have a lot of biodiversity, you can choose, you can find the solutions in your library to, to say something. Huh? We have the collection of the, these crops. Uh, as I tell you, 6,000 accession of cassava. Wow. In mm. 6,000, you can find a lot of the solutions. So nature give us some solutions, but sometimes nature doesn't. So we need to use uh, very sophisticated techniques, including uh, molecular biology, including the uh, GMOs. Uh, we develop our own GMOs. For example, in sweet potato, we have a beetle, beetle which eats the tuber. Uh, we need to use uh, the same protein using corn to, uh, to kill uh, uh, the butterflies, uh, we use the same toxin to introduce in the sweet potato to make new varieties tolerant to this beetle. So also a gene addition, as I told you, uh, in cocoa, we are working with the people in Cornell to block some transporters and to avoid the accumulation of cadmium in the sea. So yes, uh, mainly we have, we find the solutions in the, this generous biodiversity, but sometimes we need to use from the modern uh, molecular biology techniques, but not too much. <laughs> it's just in few cases, yeah. Thank you. Sure. A wonderful talk. Uh, my husband and I drink Colombian Peaks coffee every day. Uh, how important <laughs> we've got to have it. <laughs> but uh, how important is coffee growing in Colombia? Coffee in Colombia is not just an economic activity, it's a cultural activity. So we have been growing coffee for 200 years. So yeah. this is a yeah. family business by generations, the people uh, grow coffee. So sometimes the price is good, sometimes the price is bad, sometimes uh, cheap coffee <laughs> from Asia, Vietnam, or from Central America, or even Brazil, uh, is a very hard 
petition for our copy, but we keep the copy quality. It, this is like a national security issue. So <laughs> the quality of the copy is very important. The government is take in eye every coffee activity here in Colombia. Actually, coffee uh, industry or the coffee land has its own research station. Maybe it's the most older research station in, in Colombia from coffee. So coffee is a very important issue here, not just for business, also for culture. And as I tell you, it's like a national security <laughs> crop, <laughs> like corn for you or something like that. Yeah, it's very, very big deal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We've been, we will continue to enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Everybody here knows Juan Valdez, right? <laughs> Yeah. Yes, right. yes, 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 it's a very famous and actually it's a country brand is not uh, from uh, a specific company. This brand is from the government, actually, uh, Juan Valdez is the way to sell and to make a, a marketing in the world from the Colombian coffee. Yes, it's from the government and from the coffee makers. Uh, or coffee crops and uh, farmers. Uh, here, the size of the farm, coffee farm, is very small. There are a lot, around 500,000 families growing coffee mm -hmm. in Colombia. It has a very important social impact, different to cut flowers or the other you know, coffees for the small farmers. It's very important. And the coffee land area, you can find the best roads, the best schools, the best hospitals, the best everything. Uh, making by the coffee money. They, they reimburse the, the, the money in the, in the area. So the, a lot of the Colombian development came from coffee. Mm -hmm. Historic. Very good. Yeah. Hello, Juan. Good good night. Thank you for your talk. Can you hear me? Yes, Marcos. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Please. Yeah. Nice talk. It was very interesting to see all these uh, fruits and and the crops you're growing there. So I noticed many of them are uh, depending on pollinators for you know for pollination so mm -hmm. my question i have two questions one of them is how do you address the uh, pollinators you know if you have many naturally or if you are doing something to to increase the number of pollinators and the second question is about gene bank do you have any seed repositories to preserve all these varieties or are they preserving like in living uh, uh, collections so these are my two questions Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marcos. Yes, for the pollinators, yes, these this plants depends a lot of the pollination. You know, in the tropics, uh, the coevolutions between plants and insects is very strong. In the template areas, the wind makes the job. But here in the tropics is the life which makes the job. And so the pollinator is very important. Uh, we have um, insects, bats, hummingbirds, uh, a lot of uh, pollinator species. And the relationship between crops is very uh, unique. So not any pollinator works. So we need to keep them. So we are working with uh, environmentalists uh, to keep some areas close to the crops areas. Uh, like wild areas to make this environmental service, pollination, pollinator environmental service available. But sometimes we need also to, to take uh, uh, bees. Uh, uh, we have uh, hives, we call that, yes, hives uh, colonies around the crops. 
Um, we are working right now with the pollination uh, strategies, and we have increased. I didn't show you uh, another important fruit in Colombia is from the Passiflora family, the patient fruit. I forgot to, to show you some uh, very nice work we have developed in patient fruits species. Um, we developed a pollinator strategy and we double the yield production. Not just the, the yield, also the quality. Uh, especially in berries. We, we used to grow also blackberries here in Colombia, very native blackberries. Um, if we use pollinators, um, bees, or we can increase the quality, the size of the product, of the fruit, the number, the size, and the quality of the product at the same time using pollinators. The pollination is a, becoming a new industry in Colombia, like a fertilizer, pest control, or some, it's like an agricultural practice right now. It's becoming a very important uh, agricultural practice. But we used to keep also wild areas around the, the crops in order to have this natural offer. And uh, for the... What was your second question? Sorry, Marcos. Uh, I don't yeah, it's about gene bank. Like, how do you yeah. store all these seeds and tubers and varieties? Yes, we have a huge uh, fridge here in, in, in the field station close to Bogota. Uh, we have a storage uh, under cold conditions. Um, my minus 20 Celsius degrees, we keep uh, the seeds. Uh, also, four Celsius degrees is okay for some of the seeds. Uh, but for the crops, we they don't use seeds like cassava, plantain, sugarcane. We need to keep the field crops in the in the in the field. But also uh, these gene banks uh, are for the currently domesticated varieties, but we want to keep also the process. That means the farmer, the farmer collections of the farmer selection. We want to keep this process to develop new varieties or new accessions for the future. So we are working in ex situ collection the seeds collection, but also the ex situ, uh, in situ collections where the farmer still develop the relationship with the crop. And so we are working on that also because we realize that it's very important make new uh, accessions or keep the selection process in the field. Yeah, okay, that's great. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Marcos. Thank you. Jill has her hand up. Hi. Um, thank you. That was a really, really great talk. I loved all of your slides. I really like that tomato composition. I wish I could have a copy of that to hang on my wall. Um, mm -hmm. But thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I was thinking of uh climate change i mean you know do you can you comment on how climate change um goes into your thinking about some of the crops that you may want to focus more on or some things that may not work out as well over the years as things change or is it not that big a deal in colombia <laughs> no it is a big deal uh, we have a uh, very strong dry seasons and also very strong wet seasons, very raining seasons. Um, yes, the crops, the crop breeding also has some challenges. Usually is yield, usually is disease resistance, pest resistance, but right now we need to deal with uh, climate change conditions. So we are looking for uh, potatoes uh, 
which grow under dry conditions, very low water availability. Uh, and we have we had found some in our collection uh, some uh, accessions tolerance to to dry conditions. So we are working on it uh, for the for cassava. We are working in the contrary, in wet tolerant to wet conditions because the the cassava land uh, is most uh, flat. So it used to be um, with water, the water doesn't move very easily. So we need to protect the, the, the crop from, and because this is in the soil, under the soil, so we need to protect the, that. And we are looking right now for those traits. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of gene collection, but sometimes we don't know what we are storing. You know? So we, we need to, Every time we have a problem, we need to make a screening in all collection to see if we have the, the solution there. So we are working right now to looking for dry tolerance, cold, also cold tolerance, um, and uh, wet conditions tolerance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Thanks again for a great talk. Thank you. This is Ed, I have another question. I've been getting emails about Xylella of uh, Vesidiosa, that terrible uh, fungus that's affecting lots of crops in Europe right now and watching YouTube's on it. Are you bracing for that in Colombia? I don't think you have it there yet, do you? No, no, fortunately no, not yet. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But are you already are you searching for it just in case it shows up? Does it, I mean, it's a monster for agriculture, really. No, uh, our main worry right now was a uh, banana disease, the new disease oh, okay. in America. Can you imagine? Uh, but accidentally, we got a uh, fungi disease. We can kill the bananas field. Mm -hmm. And you know, bananas is a clonal crop. Each, if you have 10,000 banana plants are genetically the same. If one, yeah. if that is susceptible to the disease, it can destroy everything. So we are very worried that this is, uh, uh, was found in Colombia three years ago and everybody is scary. So Ecuador, Nicaragua, yeah. Guatemala, Salvador, we are containing in the area. We destroy the cross field. Uh, mm -hmm. We have receiving a lot of international help to control the, the disease. And we ha are having um, a successful controlling the disease. This is the major nightmare right now mm. here in Colombia um, in terms of plant diseases. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your super talk. Hi, this is uh, Judy. I'm wondering, are you also looking at uh, possibly other um, um, cultivars of the uh, banana because of the fact that it's uh, propagated clonally? Yes, we are working hard in that. Actually, we import varieties from France. They have a huge collection of bananas. I don't know why, but they have a, a huge collection of bananas. So we import uh, a lot of uh, bananas from France. Uh, they are right now in quarantine because we, we cannot, we don't want to introduce more, more problems. So they are now in quarantine. We are working with Brazil to import more and with Australia. Most of the Musa species came from Indonesia, uh, these uh, islands in the south of the Pacific. So we are importing to make crosses and to look for uh, tolerant uh, bananas uh, plants. But the problem is the market. Uh, change the habits of the uh, banana customers. It's very hard. You want to see this 
yellow, a beautiful banana, cheap. I mean, you can buy, I don't know right now, but in my time, five, four years ago, you can buy four or five bananas for $1. I mean, it's the cheapest fruit ever. And the high quality all year, doesn't matter the season. So bananas in the US, it's a, a very important market. I We are afraid um, if, what, if we change the form, the color, the size of the banana, the market um, can be hard, strong, to release the new varieties. So we are working in uh, have resistance in the current varieties. It's just one, actually, it's Cavendish, banana Cavendish, it's just one in all America. It's amazing how, uh, how vulnerable is this crop and is this, this market. So we are working in the Cavendish to make it that more resistant or tolerant but maybe in the future, we need to change our habits or accept another kind of bananas. Yeah, maybe in the short future, I will say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a question in the chat um, from Michael Skoll. Dr. Palacio, muy buena presentación. Gracias. Have you reached out specifically to President Petro about this extraordinary opportunity for Colombia? Now seems the best time to engage the new government in a nonpartisan scheme. Yes, we are having a very interesting times here. Yeah. It's a new wind, political wind <laughs> here in Colombia. We are a government uh, agency, so we need to listen to him <laughs> in order to, to work with his agenda. So, but the good news until now, they double the budget for the next year for our agency. So this is a good news. Uh, they want to improve uh, avocado. Colombia is making a great exporter of avocado. We, we took the varieties from Mexico, the same has uh, variety of avocado. So we are, uh, he wants to improve the avocado, avocado crops here in Colombia. But the issue is the avocado in Colombia grows in the same place where the coffee grows. So this is a huge competition. And as I told you, coffee is a big issue here. So the coexistence between avocado and coffee, we are dealing with that. Uh, but uh, this Petro government is moving from oil, coal, uh, minerals to go back to agricultural stuff. Colombia in the, I will say in the eighties, changed the economy. Uh, changed from agricultural economy to uh, natural resources economy. Uh, so he wants to go back again to the agricultural economy. So he doubled our budget for the next year, which is a good news. Uh, so let's say what, what happened is it's very early. He has been in the government for two months. Actually, yesterday was the, the, the Secretary of the State was here in Colombia. Yeah, the US Secretary of State was here talking with Petro. So that is a good news. We have a good relationship still with US. Uh, <laughs> So we didn't expect that because it's a, a, a left wind. So yeah, it looks like the relationship with the US, our main market is still okay. And um, also the relationships with the, with the businessmen in Colombia is still okay. So hopefully the conditions will be the same. 
Um, this is Jill again. I just had a quick question about coffee. Um, is it grown sustainably, shade grown, organic? I mean, are there, is it a mixture of how it's grown? We have a mix. Uh, the traditional coffee plant uh, using some chemical supplies, but also the organic crops uh, are growing because they pay double. And so that is a, a very interesting market. Is We have these um, stamps, the frog stamp, uh, this kind of rainforest. So they, they this market is moving. The, it's very specific niche market, but is becoming the growing um, the main buyers, Starbucks, Nestlé, uh, Ely in Europe, in Italy, they are taking more in consideration the quality of the coffee. Uh, um, they are forcing or, yeah, forcing to use less uh, chemical uh, supplies in the, in the coffee land, and they are becoming very organic. Uh, it's becoming a very important issue, and the price is good. So the people is looking for a good price right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Rob Soaring asks, how is cattle ranching expanding in the Amazon and the Orinco? Orinco? <laughs> yeah. Orinoco region. Uh, the, the Orinoco region is like a savanna, so it's natural uh, grassland. So don't worry there for the forest, but the Amazon is an issue. Uh, the land owners, landlords are becoming very aggressive, uh, taking first good wood. I mean, taking the, the, the very rich wood in the Amazon basin and the cattle is growing. This government is against that. Actually, we received <laughs> some helicopters. We use the, the, the American uh, help we used to receive is by helicopters, weapons, and all this stuff for the military. But right now, a uh, few, few weeks ago, we received from some helicopter from the US government just to work to avoid the devastation of the Amazon, just for that purpose. So that is the military aid is changing more than controlling uh, cocaine crops is controlling the deforestation of the Amazon. So this government wants to stop that, but it's a big issue. Because this land, the Amazon basin, is very far away from the civilization. So take control of that is a very big issue. But right now we are receiving tools like helicopters <laughs> to control, to control, to make presence there. Mm -hmm. But it's an issue, very important issue. Hi. Hi, this is Ed again. I'm wondering if I could ask the group a pawpaw question after our talk is over. So I just Sorry, tried... again? Well, I wanted to ask our group, I have, maybe I'll just ask now if maybe you're interested. Um, right now, I have, um, I don't know if you can see this, but I have very, very late pawpaws. They're about a month later than they usually are. And I'm wondering if anybody else has seen this going on because this really surprised me. I've never seen this in decades that 
they come, uh, you know, the, well, they're actually just ripe today. This, in case you don't know, this is our plant, or I don't know if you can see it very well, but our, our club plant is the pawpaw. And I just happened to grab our cup today, just to remind us that we actually do have this club plant. So I'm just wondering if anybody in the group has seen Lake Pawpaws. And this is a, a native sort of a tropical fruit in the Ananaceae, which is related to guanabana and soursop and, and other fruits like that. But this is the one that can grow here in the Washington DC area in zone six, in zone seven. And it grows in zone six as well. So I don't know if anybody would speak to that. I don't mean to interrupt the talk, but I thought maybe we were near the end. Yeah, I, I, I actually saw uh, some of them still uh, on right, but that was uh, this weekend on Cornell, which is uh, Ithaca, New York is very cold there. Mm. And I yeah. saw them, yeah, still even, not even uh, completely developed. I think it's like half the size of this. So I think they're gonna be right in maybe a, a couple more weeks or- Really? Oh, yeah. But you said that's Cornell, so yes, it's it's colder. So, so we're a lot warmer here. Our pawpaws usually fall in late August or the first week of September, but this is October. And were those on in uh, Roosevelt Island? I mean, or have you taken a look at what's going on with all those pawpaws there? Well, the, this tree's in my backyard. Okay, and the tree looks healthy. I do have a tree in the front yard that looks really wacko. I don't know what it's got, but this tree looks healthy. So they're ripe today, you know, very fragrant. If anybody remembers pawpaws. So Juan, this plant is, uh, it's been investigated in the past about developing it for a uh, uh, more wider sale, but the uh, time it's ripe is very, very short for, for each one. So they, you can't transport it to the supermarket and uh, not have it spoil and have enough time to sell it. Um, but individuals can grow it and it grows wild. Yeah, it's very fragrant. And actually I got my fishnet and took it off the tree about three days ago before the raccoons got it, you know, because if it would fall to the ground, something would probably eat it very quickly. And so in three days it ripened and it's very, very nice to smell today. I don't think of it as being that late for it. Okay. That's what I was thinking. Um, I think of end of September. Really? This is just a little bit into October. Okay. Kathy and I went to a talk out in Kearneysville, Maryland by, um, well, there are two people, but- West Virginia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, it was funny. I thought it was Maryland. <laughs> Um, but anyway, it was uh, a guy named Peterson is the person who's doing the, you know, has the passion to drive the, taking it to industry. And he's been collecting all these different um, varieties and he had a big table of samples, like eight or nine different varieties. And they were really different. It was really, really fun. Um, and they were all right, like a few weeks ago. Um, mm, okay. And he wanted us to give comments on, you know, the flavor and what we like best and it was pretty cool. Okay. I recall riding down the Sino Canal from from um, uh, up in Cumberland and, and eating pawpaws in the middle of October. So they were, they were coming down uh, then and, and in a good shape. So that right now is, is not too early. Okay. It just never happened before in my yard since, since 1986. So I was just wondering what was, what was going on. There's a postdoctoral researcher visiting right now at the Smithsonian who's studying grapes, but her previous appointment and her PhD research was on the genomics of Paul Paul. Mm -hmm. um, in the South of Spain, they're actively doing uh, very wide, uh, in-depth genomic research on the Ananaceae, including our Paul Paul and then the other ones you mentioned. So whatever your question is, pretty soon we might have a molecular answer for what is driving its um, ripening habits with respect to photo period. <laughs> 
Have you heard anything about toxicity of the pawpaw? I was uh, reading, uh, uh, I was talking to someone and they said they had stopped encouraging people to grow it because if you have a lot of pawpaw, I don't remember what the compound is, but uh, it can have health issues in humans. Hmm. Has anyone heard of that? Yes, I think you have to eat it every day, all day. I mean, the amount of pawpaws that is consumed is pretty minimal. I mean, so I don't think it's a real problem. I know I've heard of it. Do you remember what the people, compound is? No. Mm -mm. No, I can't remember what it is, but some people can't handle it baked. That the compound is worse when it's heated. Hmm. It's temperature dependent. Hmm. But if you eat it raw, they have no problems, but some people just can't handle it when it's heated. Hmm. So here in Wiki, it says the fruit contain acetogenins, including the neurotoxin, anonacin, I guess would be pronounced. And so perhaps that bothers some people. I don't know. I know in the 70s, I had a professor that in, at the University of Kansas, he ate about a peck or so. He was sick for about two weeks. All is good in moderation. Um, <laughs> but speaking, but speaking of not in moderation, uh, this whole talk, Juan, just reminds me of the connection between Colombia and the United States. Um, my grandmother consumed a carafe of Yuban coffee every morning and a potato dish every evening. It always had potatoes in it. Um, we get your coffee, but I wish we could get those those wonderful varieties of potatoes here in the States. It's just, I guess, because of phytosanitation and fungal related issues, it's just, we can import flowers from Colombia, but we just can't have the potatoes. So, yet, hopefully someday. Hopefully, yes. Um, are there any other questions? Um, for the speaker. Then I guess that's a wrap. Thank you so much, Juan, for sharing your knowledge and expertise mm -hmm. with us. And this is a Thank enlightening you. talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thank it was you. wonderful. Muy bueno. <laughs> Thank you, you guys. Um, you are welcome to Colombia every time. Uh, oh, don't tempt me. <laughs> then I'll hold you. <laughs> the safety conditions are improving a lot, so it's a safe time to come here. Good, good. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Sure. All right, well, okay. have a good evening. Hey. Thanks.